All right, good morning. <clears throat> it is a pleasure to be with you here again this week. Excited to be here. A little nervous now that uh, Pastor Bucky's here and is sitting under this preaching. Now he can critique it and uh, he can critique it live. So, <clears throat> All right, this morning, like uh, the last time I was here, we're going to be looking in the book of Hebrews. Uh, last time I was here two weeks ago, we looked at Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, and today we're going to be looking in Hebrews chapter 10. And the reason being is... Um, this is something that, uh, as a ministry, I've been putting together uh, because I deal with this a lot on the street. And so my prayer is that since I've already been working on this and putting this together for uh, our ministry and for the, uh, the people that I run into out on the streets to evangelize, that, that God would use this and bless you in some way as well. And so we're going to be looking at, I said, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Uh, and my desired goal for this is to focus on the church of God and more specifically the local church. Okay? It is not uncommon to have conversations with professing Christians and they say something along the lines of, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And, and to that I say, that's true. You don't need to go to church to be a Christian. However, Christians go to church. All right, and so hopefully as we begin to look at this passage and then look at the church, we'll be able to unpack that a bit uh, and help you see the beauty. Behold our God, behold the King, let us come and adore Him and worship Him, and hopefully we'll be able to see that uh, today. Another phrase you may hear is this, church membership is not in the Bible, so therefore you can be a Christian without being a member of a local church. And when I hear this one, I usually think to myself, okay, Either you have not really read the New Testament or you're a new believer and you don't understand some of what you're reading there. Because as we will see later on um, today, there are plenty of scriptures that refer to the church. And while we may not see a direct command that says, go be a member of a church, it's implied in the New Testament. And, and in the first century, to be a member of a church, to be baptized into Christ... And profess that would cost you your life, cost you your family. It would cost so much more than in our context today that we see that. So we have, over time, developed a, a less of um, importance of being members of a church. And hopefully, again, with that as well, I'll be able to unpack that uh, for you here today. Or this one. Here's another saying that I've heard in the past. I'm guilty of saying in the past. Um, and, and I think needs to be addressed, is Christianity is not a religion, but a relationship. I'm sure we've all heard that. I've even <laughs> said that. Um, while I know that many who say that have good intentions in, in wanting to emphasize the relationship of those who follow, follow Christ, because we do have a relationship with Christ, but we can't ignore the fact that it is a religion. If you look up the definition of religion, it's to follow a certain set of beliefs, a certain set of practices. And as Christians, we do that, right? We do that on a regular basis. But if you look with me at the book of James, which is not where we're going to be, but I just want to show you this here. James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Verse 26 says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their afflictions and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So in verse 26 there, the, the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, um, brings up being religious. He doesn't say it's wrong to be religious, but he's speaking about taming the tongue, uh, in which we see in, in James chapter 3, this taming of the tongue, which is hard to do in the flesh, but in the spirit we can do that because we have Christ indwelling in us, and we are able then to work those things out because the spirit moves in our hearts. But what he's saying here is it's not that religion is bad, but if you claim to be religious and you can't keep your tongue and your religion is worthless. So it's not that religion is bad. We need to understand that. Um, and then in verse 27, it says, religion that is pure and undefiled. So there is a religion that is pure and undefiled. And I would say to you here today that that religion is the Christian faith. 
It is the Christian religion for which we here adhere to. And, and so it's not that religion is bad, but that uh, we as Christians need to understand that while we do have a relationship with Christ, we are, we are a religion. Okay? And so sometimes we hear that. Now, if you, if you look at James chapter 3 real quick, as I mentioned, in verses 1 through 12, this chapter is dealing with, as I said, the taming of the tongue. And I'm going to start reading in verse 5, and my emphasis is going to be on verses 8 through 10. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, <clears throat> a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. And so my emphasis here from verses 8 through 10. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursings. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. So James is writing this and he says, these things ought not to be so. The, one, the way one talks, the things that come out of their mouth of, of professing believers is very telling. Uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, we read in, in Matthew 12 and Luke, 60, or Luke 6, 45. That's why I'm always taken back when I get into conversations with people who claim to be a Christ uh, and, and even maybe go to church regularly uh, and they appear to be a believer. Uh, but when you get out of the context of the body of Christ, out of the church, um, things come out of their mouth in conversations uh, or they post things online on social media. Then you're thinking to yourself, would you say that in front of your pastor? And if you wouldn't say that in front of your pastor, I mean... Why would you think it's okay to say that in any context? Because does not God speak and hear and know all things, right? And we're all, I'm sure, guilty of this because we are sinners by nature and we've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. And so therefore, we are continuing to work these things out in our lives. And as I said, by the Spirit of God indwelling us, we are able to overcome these things. As the writer of James here says, the Apostle James, that these things ought not to be so. So going back to James chapter 1, as I said, you know, verse 27 tells us that religion is pure and undefiled. So we see that there's this pure and undefiled religion of taking care of widows and orphans, taking care of those in need, loving for our neighbors. As, you know, Pastor Buck mentioned, uh, I don't know who was the couple back here, okay, in the back that are putting together things to go out and help those in need, right? And we're going to see this is the church. This is the church in action. Right? This is what the church is, is, is called to, to be, that light that shines, that city on a hill. Christ being the light, and we are this to shine him out to the world. Right? And so when I say religion is what we are as Christians, I want to make that difference. Because what people tend to, when they say that, and, and, and most of the time when they say that, they're saying it in good faith. Because they see uh, the, the religious works of something like, say, the Roman Catholic Church. And so they, they see that and see that those religious works can't save anyone. And so they make those comments like, well, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. So I understand the, the, the motive behind that for many people. But I think that we need to uh, rightly understand we are a religion. Christianity is the true faith. It is pure and undefiled before God because it is based upon, as I mentioned the last uh, time I was here, the object of our faith, which is Christ. Because a person can have faith. We can have faith in all kinds of things. But the object of that faith must be Christ. And if the object of our faith is Christ, then from that will flow many different things because we are his worksmanship, which he has prepared in us to do. Ephesians 2.10. So this is true religion. So how does one, and it tells us there in verse uh, um, 27 of chapter 1 there. Sometimes I get excited and I jump ahead and I'm thinking in my head where I want to go and then it's not there. So just bear with me. Um, 
But he says we are to keep oneself unstained from the world. So how does one keep themselves unstained from the world? Well, that's what I want to try to unpack here as we look at Hebrews chapter 10. Okay? So we'll turn back over there to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Let me read this to you here. Actually, before I read this, um, since we're going to jump into uh, the message here now, let, let me pray uh, and ask God to bless our time together. Uh, gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come here and to, uh, to fill the pulpit for Pastor Bucky. And I just thank you for him, Lord. And I just pray that the church would be blessed by uh, this message here today, that they would be encouraged and edified. Uh, Father, uh, calm any nervousness that I, nervousness that I may have. Help me to speak with clarity of speech. Uh, help me to have a sound mind as I bring forth uh, what is prepared here today. Uh, that again, this body of believers, this local body, would see the bride of Christ as beautiful as you have declared it to be. And that you are working in your bride to bring it about each and every day in our lives, individually and corporately. And help us to see that corporate side of, of your, your church, Lord. So I pray that today uh, be with us. Help us to have the eyes to see and ears to hear uh, what your word says to us today. And uh, may you bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so verses 19 through 25. Um, now, when we was driving out here, my daughter said, what are you, what are you preaching on? I said, Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. And she said, what's it about? I said, you have a Bible? <laughs> Open it up and read it. So she, she opened it and she said, well, that's not very long. And so um, <laughs> it, won't, it won't be as long as it could be. But as I said last time, and I want to encourage the others that are not here, um, Pastor Buck preached on Hebrews uh, three years ago. I believe he was on that series. And so you can go back and listen to the whole thing. Hebrews is just so rich, such a rich book. Um, and he's got them up on your uh, uh, YouTube page there, and you can go back and listen to all that um, there. But I'm going to try to touch and scratch the surface on some of this here uh, just to point us and help us see, again, the importance of the church and specifically the local church. So follow along with me. Uh, I'm reading from the ESV. I'm not sure if everybody has the same, but uh, uh, verses 19 through 25 in Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with, a pure, with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And may God bless the reading of, of his word. Now, in this passage of scripture, we see an ending of a discourse, okay? There's an ending of a discourse that's taking place here. The writer of, of Hebrews, which I said I believe is, is the Apostle Paul, as he's writing this, he's ending this discourse that starts back in chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. That's a long discourse, right? Chapter 4 all the way to chapter 10. And I want to look there and, and look at some of these parallels. And he's, he's closing this out, this discourse. He's going to end this. And then we get into Hebrews chapter 11, which is that, that hall of faith. You're probably familiar where we go through, you know, it's by faith and by faith and by faith. All these people that have come before us, right? So let's look at, at Hebrews chapter 4 and see these parallels because this is the beginning of that bookmark, right, of this discourse. So Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Now, <clears throat> if you can keep your finger there and look at chapter 10, I want to point a few things out here. This is where I'm saying this is the beginning of, of a, a discourse and the end of the discourse. I want to show you the similarities and hopefully, hopefully you see these here. So when we see, since we have in verse 14 of chapter 4, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Then we come to Hebrews 10 and we look at verse 21. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. All right, we see these similarities here. He's drawing this, this comparison. He mentions Jesus, the Son of God. We see here it's by the blood of Jesus, pointing him. He's our high priest. He's the one that we are, are focused upon. He is the one that our faith rests in. It's Jesus Christ. We see here also, um, it says in verse 14 of chapter 4, let us hold fast our confession. We see that again in verse 23 of chapter 10. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. All right? I feel like I'm missing one. Here I am. Okay. So then, back in chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. And then again, back in chapter 10, uh, he tells us in verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience of our body. Now, hopefully you've seen the parallels here that he is, he is making that emphasis again. This is the book end. He's, he's bringing this to close as he's about to get into the, the hall of faith. So now, as we can think about faith, and as I said, our, our faith rests upon Christ, I think it's important that we, we, we look at what the gospel is. I think it's always important to look at the gospel, even as believers. It's not something we hear one time and then move on. This is something that we have to rest upon day in and day out as a believer, looking at the gospel. Because the scripture, the scripture tells us that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, uh, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's in 1 Corinthians 1.18. So the power of God unto salvation, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, is the gospel. Right? Romans 1.16, it's the gospel message. This is how God saves people, through the gospel message. And Paul tells us what the gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. So, as someone, again, that goes out on the streets, I know Pastor Buck's been out on the streets, um, and we've had conversations with people. Even as a pastor, he shared the gospel with people, and maybe even you have shared the gospel with someone, and sometimes people receive it. Sometimes they reject it. So why is it that some hear the message and receive it, and some hear it and they reject it? Well, the answer is this. Uh, God saves the elect. Uh, at the appointed time and place of his choosing, God opens the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf that they see and hear his good news and come. Jesus said in, in John 10, my sheep hear my voice and they come. That's why when you're out and you're preaching the gospel, you, you can preach the gospel to two people that hear the exact same message and one receives and the other walks away. I've used this analogy in, in talking with my, uh, my in-laws um, because they, they don't adhere to uh, a, a more reformed view of soteriology, which is fine. You can still be Christian and, and not adhere to that. Um, but one of their arguments is, you know, you have this will to choose God, and so it's based upon your own free will of choosing. And, and having that dialogue, I say to them, I said, look, you, you raised your children as Christians. You have four daughters. You raised them all in the same house with the same message given to all four of them. Why is it that two of them profess faith and the other two don't live like that? They've all heard the same message. They all were raised by the same parents in the same household with the same rules. Why is it these two profess it and these two live completely contrary to it? Right? Because it is God's sheep who hear his voice and they come. And that's not to say that they may not come at some point down the line. They could be God's sheep and it's not the appointed time or place for them yet. And so we continue to preach the gospel to our children. We continue to preach the gospel to our friends and our family. We continue to preach the gospel to the lost. To love them. Because we want them to come. And we don't know who is the elect, so we therefore we go and preach. 
Now, Jesus explains this uh, to Nicodemus in, in John chapter 3. Let's look there. It's familiar, I'm sure, with, with, with you. And we will get back to Hebrews 10 here. I just want to build this up here and really look at this gospel and then look at how one receives faith. So in John chapter 3, this is a very famous passage. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, or only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Many people are very familiar with John 3.16. Even unbelievers could probably quote it to you. But we're going to look before that. Now, Nicodemus is this Pharisee. He comes to Jesus at night. And in uh, verse 2, he says to, to Jesus, he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He can't see it unless he's born again. Let that sink in. He can't see it. He can't see the kingdom of God. As I said in, in, in uh, Corinthians 1, it says it's the foolishness. The cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They can't see it. They can't understand it. Right? Something has to happen. And then in verse 5, Jesus answers him again, and he's repeating this, which obviously you've got two things happening here. He says, truly, truly, which is pointing this emphasis because he's, he's saying it more than once, to say, listen to this. This is important. So not only does he say, truly, truly, he says it again, truly, truly. Right? So this is very important. He says in verse 5, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then he says in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. We understand what that means, right? It's maybe one of the children. You're born of the flesh. You know, a parent gives birth. A child, mother gives birth to her child. Right? It's born of the flesh. The flesh only begots flesh. It cannot become spiritual unless the Spirit moves. This being born again is a regeneration that happens in the heart of a believer. This being born again is a, a changing that dead nature that is dead in its trespasses and sin and making it alive. So then we are able then to respond and freely come to Christ. So he says that that which is born of the flesh is flesh, flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And he says, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. He says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. They don't know where he's coming and where he's going to, whose heart he's going to move upon. That's why, as Christians, we love our neighbors and we love our friends and our families to tell them the gospel. Because we don't know if the Spirit's going to move on them or not. It is our desire to see that happen. But it's also our desire to trust in the sovereign work of God to do that. This is so comforting as someone, as, I, as I've mentioned before and, and today, that goes out and evangelizes to people on the street. It's very comforting to me. I don't, I don't know everything that the Bible teaches. I, I'm constantly continuing to learn, as we all are. So I don't know everything. I don't have an answer for every question that comes to me. But it's so comforting to know that even if I poorly present the gospel, even if I poorly answer somebody's questions, I mean, we got our college evangelism tour coming up in a couple weeks, even if I, one of these college kids are way smarter than me, and they know all about biology and all chemistry and all these things, and I'm like, I can tell you what two plus two is, I don't, I don't know geometry and you know getting deep into that, even if they have that type of knowledge, I can trust that. This is what the Word of God says. That unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't enter the kingdom of God. And God calls you to repent and turn to Christ, that you may live. And know and trust that it's not on me. God is the one who's going to do that work. So it is uh, the grace of God that moves in the hearts of a dead man and it regenerates them to new life, uh, for which then they receive that gospel message, uh, as Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, that it is by grace we've been saved through faith, 
This is the means by which God, God saves his people. It's by his grace and it's by the faith that he provides to that person to then receive that message. And he does so through the gospel. Because not only does God uh, declare the end from the beginning, but he also declares the means by which to get there. And we Christians, brethren, sisters, we are part of that means. We are part of that means. Right? So we see that those who are foreknown, as it says in Hebrews chapter, or Romans chapter 8, those who are foreknown are predestined and then they are called and then they are justified through Christ's redeeming work on the cross and will receive glorification when the Lord returns. And we know that when God says something in his word, God is not the one who lies. And we can trust in that. We can rest in that. We can find great comfort and joy in that. And it is, um, it is a great joy for us uh, when we gather together on the Lord's day to, to, to meditate upon those things that Christ died and saved us. And we gather together as the church to worship him, to praise him, to grow in the knowledge and understanding of of who he is. Now coming back to Hebrews chapter 10 in verses 20 through two, 22 through 25 uh, we see the author craft this passage around three focal exhortations. Alright? Let me give you these three. <clears throat> let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Number two, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. And then number three, let us consider how to stir up one another. So these three exhortations are given to us, and they're ultimately pointing us to that verse 25, which tells us not to forsake the assembling together, not to neglect the meeting together. Okay, so we get these exhortations that are pointing us to that, and then that final exhortation that will come. So the basis of this first exhortation, let us draw near, is verses 19 uh, through 21. Let me read them again to you. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. Now, if you're familiar with, I don't know if pastors is preached through uh, maybe Leviticus, I'm sure that would be a long time. <laughs> A long book to go through a lot there um, maybe he's mentioned this you know under the old covenant right under the old covenant we see it even when Jesus dies on the cross there's this veil in the temple that separates the holy from the holy of holies you have this inner sanctuary and then this inner inner of the sanctuary this is this is the holy of holies and there's this veil there's this veil there that separates and you can't go into that you and I would not be able to go into that. As Gentiles, we couldn't even get into the inner court. We couldn't stay in the outside, right? So you couldn't even go into this Holy of Holies. And only once a year on the Day of, uh, the day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, only once a year the great high priest, or the high priest, not the greatest high priest, that's Christ, but the high priest would go in there. Only once a year. And he would offer up sacrifice, sprinkling the blood and incense, and he would offer that up for his sins and for the sins of the people once a year. This was something that they had to keep. This was under that old covenant. Now, we know when Christ died on the cross, what happened to that veil? It was separated. That, that veil that, that separated the holies of holies was torn from, from top to bottom. This veil is, is torn just like the once for all sacrifice of Christ did on the cross. He, he, he once for all died, and so this, this veil that was torn, that once the, that the high priest would go into to, to offer up the sacrifice, Christ's body was torn on the cross that we could enter in, not once a year, but permanently. We have access to this Holy of Holies, to this heavenly sanctuary through Christ. And that's what the writer tells us here, this curtain, that is through the flesh, through his flesh that was broken and torn for us, that we can enter in to this, this uh, um, heavenly sanctuary. Now the author of Hebrews 
here in a figure of speech, as I said, he identifies this veil as the temple of Christ's body. Um, and and I, I just find that fascinating. I was talking to my wife about this last night as we was, we was looking at this, and uh, I was going over this with her, and, and I'm sharing it with her, and I said, that just, that just baffles my mind, just looking at the connections here. And you'll see that. And as I mentioned last time when I was here, because I deal with a group out on the streets called the, the and I always say, so-called Hebrew Israelites, they focus a lot on the Old Testament. It has caused me to spend more time in the Old Testament. And when you're looking at these, these types that point to Christ, this anti-type, it just unopens these scriptures and you see these, these, these beautiful beautiful things in scripture where you see Christ fulfilling these things that are in the Old Testament that we don't even really think about it just unfolds and you're like wow you're amazed by, by God and what he has put in his word and it's active and it's living and it continues to <clears throat> change us and mold us and grow us it's amazing uh, now, now the manner in which we draw near to God okay we, we, we draw near to God the manner in which we do that is with a true and sincere heart, with a renewed heart, one that is right with God, with right desires. And the means by which we, we do this is, it tells us in, in the scripture there, is to have a true and sincere heart, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. The blood of Christ is sprinkled on it by the Spirit of God, which, as I said, is the Spirit of God moving in us. It purges us from dead works, cleanses us from all sin, and therefore we may draw near with freedom and boldness, with readiness and cheerfulness, and with a reverence of godly fear. Right? So we, we have we have this now this confidence that we can go before the throne of God, enter into his presence through Christ. Where, you know. If you look in the Old Testament, that high priest that would go in there had to have a rope tied around his, his waist and bells on it. And he had to keep moving. If he stopped moving, they pulled him out because he was probably dead. Right? That's how, 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 how important God was about this, this understanding of this holy of holy, how serious God took it. And we have access to this through Christ. Now, the second manner by which we draw near to God is in full assurance of faith. Uh, in the triune God, we have faith in, in the triune God. Without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. And it will not be accepted. But in full assurance of faith, we have acceptance with God through Christ. So we have the acceptance of God and in full assurance. The means by which is our bodies are washed with pure water. And this is not referring to baptismal water. Um, there are those who falsely teach uh, baptismal regeneration where you have to be baptized to be saved. It's not what this is referring to. But the grace of the Spirit, which is often in Scripture compared to, to water. The body and soul needs washing and renewing. It needs this internal grace of God that influences our outward actions. It's what causes us to go downtown and help those that are in need. It's what causes us as, as a church to go, uh, as a pastor, to go and, 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 uh, and, and, and preach to those in, in the prisons or preach to those that are in uh, the military or preach to, to whatever context. It's what causes us to do those things. It's that internal work of God in us. Now moving to our, our, our second exhortation, uh, let us hold fast to the confession of hope, confession of our hope. And that is found in Christ and our salvation by him. And the hope of eternal life and happiness. All right, He is the foundation, as I said, of our faith. And I, and I emphasize that a lot because a lot of times that doesn't seem to be the emphasis that people put on their faith. They put all these other things on their faith. But he needs to be the sole emphasis, the focus of our faith. Uh, another way of holding fast to the confession of our hope, and that is also very important, is in our doctrine. Especially today, uh, we see so many who pervert and twist the truth of God and forsake his word for feelings, experiences, and emotions. 
You see, quote unquote, churches that promote and accept sinful lifestyles and behavior under this banner of love and tolerance. We've all probably drove by many churches or know of people that go to places where they don't hold fast to the, to the confessions of our faith that have been given to us in God's word. They, they kind of go around with the culture. Well, the culture is, is changed over time. So, you know what? Back then, when, when Paul writes in, in Timothy that I do not uh, permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over the man, that was cultural. It's changed today. You can have a woman get up in a pulpit. God's word doesn't change and adapt to the culture. We change and conform to his word. Right? So our doctrine is important. We need to understand that while there may be some cultural things that are in scriptures, there are some commands and there are some things given that are laid out plainly that we cannot deviate from. We, we, we call them uh, the essentials of the faith. Now, there are many different churches that may hold to different, different things when it comes to maybe the mode of baptism or it comes to maybe eschatology. Um, I feel like I'm jumping ahead because I know that's later on too. But There are things we may disagree on, and that's fine. We can be believers and have those disagreements on things that are not essential. But when it comes to the essentials of the faith, anything that, that, that deals with the doctrine of God, that deals with the character of God, which includes the Trinity, which includes the deity of Christ, and then the gospel, if those things aren't in line with and step with other believers, then we're not in unity. But if they are and we disagree in some other areas, we are in unity because our unity is in Christ. And so that's why it's important for us to understand that our doctrine, we need to hold fast to it and not so be so quickly um, to forsake it and to go with whatever the, the, the world's doing uh, out there uh, today because it's going to change and tomorrow they'll be doing something different and they just want us to continue to adapt to it rather than conforming, as I said, to the Word of God. Now finally, um, and not finally that we're almost finished, but we're getting there, uh, but we come to our last exhortation. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. As Christians, uh, we have a high calling to care for, to encourage and exhort one another spiritually and morally, motivating one another to love, which is expressed in good works. This is the cornerstone of authentic Christian community, okay? Building one another up in Christ, meeting the needs of our brethren, whether in helping financially, physically, or spiritually. Not good works for justification. As I said, we're already, those in Christ are justified. So we don't, we don't do good works because we're trying to earn something to be saved. And we don't do good works to try to keep salvation, as some teach you can lose that. What God gives you, this gift that God gives you, he doesn't take it back. He doesn't say, I know all things. I'm going to save you. Oh, I didn't know you was going to sin, so therefore let me have that back. It doesn't work that way. He is the author and what? Finisher of our faith. <clears throat> Some translations, I think mine says perfecter. He brings it to its completion. Right? Doesn't mean we are without responsibility. We have to be responsible. That's the amazing thing about God. He is sovereign over our faith, but yet we still are responsible to study to show ourselves approved and to work this out, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. It's an amazing, it's hard for a, a, a finite mind to grasp the infinite mind of God. So we are to build one another up meeting the needs physically, spiritually, financially. Again, these works are not uh, for our justification or for keeping our salvation, but it's us freely giving to the body of Christ, freely giving because Christ is freely given to us. And when we do that, when we do that because we desire to glorify Him, it stops the mouths of the gainsayers. 
It evidences our faith in the world. And it profits and benefits believers and unbelievers. And what I mean that it stops the gainsayers. If it, you, ever, you ever have somebody who, as I said in the beginning, who, who may say, I'm a Christian, and then talks a certain way, or, or lives a certain way, and the world sits there and says, hey, you say this with your mouth, with your lips, but you ain't really living that way. You're not really living it out. So they gainsay. Why should I believe you and your God? Why should I believe your faith? Why should I be a Christian? You profess to believe these things, but then you live just like our neighbor down the street who is an atheist or our neighbor down the street who's a Muslim. You don't show any difference, right? But it stops the mouth of gainsayers because <coughs> what can they say bad about a Christian who is living out their faith? <coughs> that's true. They can say things bad about you, but what can they say that's true about you? Can they say, well, he loves his neighbors cares for them. He seeks to help them. He loves his church. He loves his, his pastors and his, his uh, uh, brothers and sisters in his congregation. And he, and he seeks to, to meet their needs above his own at times. Can they say those things about us? That's what we should be striving to uh, do in glorifying the Lord. To live out what we say we believe. Again, not because we're trying to earn anything, because it's a natural desire. Right? I'm married. My wife's not, not with me today, but um, I don't do things for her because I feel like eh, if I don't do this, marriage is going to be rough. I'm going to have a rough day. I naturally do it because I desire to because she's my wife. Because I love her. So if we profess to love Christ, how much more should our love look with Christ than even with our own marriage? Right? How much more should we be desiring to please God, the one who saved our souls? And it profits others and other believers as well. The world looks on and says, you know, hey, other believers see that and uh, they're profited by you. Which is, again, I want to get into later, hopefully, um, in talking about the local church, how we are, we are not given spiritual gifts for our own benefit. We're not, you're not giving a gift for your benefit. Any gifting that God has given to you is for the benefit of the church. It's for the benefit of the others. As Pastor's wife here beautifully sang the, the songs that led us in hymns, I thought, man, she's got a beautiful voice. And that, that gifting is for us to, to join in with her and, and glorify God. Right? So these giftings aren't given for us. They're given for the church. Uh, this is the reason why the local church is extremely vital in the life of believers. This is why we cannot allow the kind of talk in society, as I mentioned earlier, by professing, professing believers to speak negatively about the true biblical churches. I say true biblical churches. Because why? Because they are the bride of Christ. Brothers and sisters, if you are here today and you are truly in Christ, you are his bride. You are spotless before him. And he is continuing to grow you in grace, continuing to sanctify you. Until the day that we either step out of here because we, we meet the end of our road or he returns. And so if, if we are in love with Christ, knowing that we are the bride, we shouldn't let people speak negatively about the bride. I know I wouldn't let somebody speak negatively about my wife. I'm sure many of you would do the same. And wives probably wouldn't let their, let their husband be spoken negatively of, right? But how much more for Christ and his bride? Which... Ephesians 5 tells us he died for it. He died for the church. He died for that bride. So if you notice these three exhortations, and I kind of I'm kind of moving way faster than I thought, you know. But um, well, if you notice in these three exhortations here, the author is speaking in a plural sense. 
let us, let us, let us. So there's an individual responsibility there as believers. But he's speaking in this plural sense, in this, this corporate sense. Let us draw near to God. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Let us stir one another up to good works. There's this, there's this plural sense, this corporal sense that we are to do this in the body of believers together. <coughs> the, the Christian faith is not one that we can do on our own. So how can a brother or sister stir up one another to love and good works if they do not have a close connection with them? How can you do that? I mean, you may know somebody on Facebook, but do you really know them? You may, you may know your neighbor down the streets, but again, do you really know them? But when you come together as the body and you really get to know one another because your unity is in Christ, you can have all the differences in the world. You could grow up in, in an area that's impoverished. You know, I didn't grow up very, very wealthy. I grew up poor my whole life. And you could still have unity with somebody who's extremely wealthy because it's not in your economic stand, standing that you find you. It's in Christ. You could grow up in an all-white neighborhood and still have unity with a brother and sister who is, who is black because your unity is in Christ. It's not in your ethnic background. So you may have differences. You may have cultural differences, economic differences, societal differences. But those things shouldn't divide us because our unity is in Christ. They should draw us closer together. You may have different personalities, which I'm sure we all do. Different personalities, people that you get along easier with. But when it comes to the church, there shouldn't be cliques and factions and hang out with this group of people because I like them, because they like me. It's the church. We're going to spend eternity together. Right? So these are found, being able to do that, it's found within the local church of brothers and sisters who are doing life together with one another. And not just when they come together on the Lord's Day. Okay? But that, that's important. We need to understand the Lord's Day I'm a Sabbatarian. <laughs> so I, I believe strongly in the Lord's Day. I'm a Reformed Baptist. You know, Pastor Buck he graciously gave me that uh, the book last week and or two weeks ago on the card. He's like, it's really Reformed like you. So I'm like, I appreciated that because I, I, I am Reformed. And and um, so I, I really believe in the Lord's Day, the Sabbath day, and how we should keep it holy. How we should... should Look to come together on that day and worship the Lord together. And not replace it with other things. Hey, I'm going to go golfing today. It's my only day off, so I need to rest. It's the Lord's day. He said, one day, keep it holy. You can't take one day and come together and worship the Lord. What are we going to do for all eternity? Right? That's a long time. So these are found within the local church when we come together. But again, it's not only within the local church. When you are in a body of believers, and I was only here one time, two weeks ago. And in the time that I had of meeting the people that was here, I seen that already. The care and concern for, for Pastor Buck and for one another. And, and a desire to want to help him and meet the needs. And I was like, praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. That's how we as Christians should be doing. Wanting to meet their needs, not only on a Sunday when they come in and see how they're doing, but outside of that context, visiting them, caring for them, bringing them food when, they, when they're in need, trying to meet their needs when they have it, as the Lord provides for you to, to, to do that. Because again, all the gifts that are given to you, and that's not just spiritual gifts, that's physical gifts that you're given, financial gifts, However, you can help a brother or sister out, right? But you won't know that if you're not doing life together. You won't know that. And in an early church, they did. I mean, they sold their properties. They knew something was coming, but they sold their properties. 
and they helped those in need, the brothers and sisters that was in need. Now that's not a call to say, you know, if you, if you have money, then you got to give everything away and, and give it all to the church. That's not what that was saying. They knew 70 AD was coming, and so they, they understood the warnings that Christ gave, and, and so therefore they also, they weren't tied to the land. Israel was tied to the land, and they weren't. They were tied to Christ. And so they had no problem giving up those earthly possessions to care for their brothers and sisters in need. But sometimes we as Christians, even as Christians, we get wrapped up in our earthly desires and pleasures and things, and material things. We're all guilty of it. I'm not preaching to anybody other than myself. We're all, we're all guilty to that, of that. And we, we lose sight of what is most important. Our love for God and our love for people, especially the people of God, our brothers and sisters. It's very important. So we can, we can, we can develop a better sense of community when we, when we meet with each other outside of that. And, and there's a lot of good, 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 solid local churches that they even struggle with this. I was talking to one of my uh, co-hosts on our radio show, and, and we were talking about this, and uh, you know he had even explained to me, because we, we was talking, and we, he expressed to me this, this being in many churches in his life, he was in the Air Force, not really, not really a military guy, but he was in the Air Force. Just a joke. No. Just a joke. Bad one, I guess. But I tried. But, um, but I love him. He's a good brother. And we were talking about this, and uh, he said, yeah, I've been in many churches where the hospitality really wasn't, wasn't great, you know, outside of, of the church gathering, getting together, inviting one another over, and getting to know them. Because when you do that, though, right, when you when you take it upon yourselves to, to gather with your brothers and sisters, to invite them over, to get to know them. You can really know what their needs are. Because sometimes people don't tell you because that's in a pride. We don't want to tell somebody we're struggling. We don't want to tell somebody we have need. We don't want to tell somebody that, you know, spiritually we're struggling to read the Word of God or spiritually we're struggling to stay motivated because we that pride sets in and we want to set that that show in front of people. But when you really get to know people and invest that time in them, not because they're a project, but because you genuinely love them as a brother or sister in Christ, you begin to, to know their needs. They begin to open up, you begin to open up, and you're able to develop that with one another, that real sense of community like they had in the first century. They had that sense of community for one And as Christians, I think in our culture, we, we, we've kind of lost that. doesn't mean we have to have house churches, right, and, and, and meet together every single day. But what I'm saying is we, we've kind of lost that in our culture. As Christians, we should be seeking to try to, to bring that community back together. There should be a love for brothers and sisters that is unlike any other <clears throat> love that's out there. I mean, imagine that. In, in the first century, what were the Christians doing that were so different? If their love for one another was the same as the love the Jews had for one another, why was it different? Why did it look differently? Because it was different. They would come together and, and Paul would preach for a whole day. Somebody even died, fell out a window. Right? Sometimes, honestly, to be honest, and, and I'm guilty of this too, didn't eat breakfast. I, I didn't eat breakfast, and I'm sitting in church, and my stomach starts getting rumbling, and you're like, oh, I can't wait to get out and get something to eat. My focus goes from what I'm trying to hear from God's Word speaking to me to give me correction and edify, and, and edify me and encourage me and build me up. My focus is on, I want to eat. An hour's too long for me? And, and, and we, we lose that sense of reverence for God, for His Word, for the gathering together as the body. We're so quick to want to go in and get out. And I think that's something we all have to examine within our own hearts. You know, many times I've, I've 
had to examine that within my own heart. As I said, I'm not, I'm not preaching to you. I'm, I'm preaching to me. As any, any pastor would tell you, and I'm not a pastor, but any pastor would tell you, when they're going through the scripture to put together something, God is speaking to them first. And if he's not, they're not doing something right. They're not doing it by the, the spirit of God leading them. They're just putting together a message for you. But it's the spirit of God through his word that works on the heart of the one who's bringing the message. That's why they can stand up there and they know it because they've already been convicted by the things that God has showed them in the scripture. And so this coming together today on the Lord's Day, it's just a taste of the heavenly things. It's just a glimpse that we get to see how it's going to be when we are in eternal glory with God Almighty, praising Him every single day. We get a glimpse for a few hours on a Sunday morning. It's going to be all eternity. And a friend of mine, uh, he's a pastor in Elyria, and he, uh, I remember we, we were on the streets many times together, and somebody asked him the question of, you know, they was going into what heaven's going to be like, and all these, you know, streets of gold, and I'm going to have this, and when I get to heaven, I'm going to do this, and Christ for all eternity that's boring? No, my dear friends, brothers and sisters, that's not. That's our hope. To be with Christ. The one who saved it, the one who died for our sins. That's our hope. To be with Him. I don't know who said this. Maybe, maybe you've heard this reference before. Um, but there's a lot of people that want to go to heaven. They just don't want Christ to be there when they get there. Right? Because they want the things that, that they see are promised about heaven. No pain, no suffering, no tears, streets of gold. I think we're just going to be sitting on, on clouds with a heart. <laughs> no. It's the worship of Christ. You know, the, the, I want to get off the rabbit trail, but when you look at when you're reading through Revelation, you see the angels around the throne all day and all night. They're just holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Just praise Him because He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. And so, as believers, we should, when we get this taste of the heavenly things, we should enjoy that. We should, we should, we should love to get up on a, on a Sunday morning and say, I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to see my brothers and sisters. I'm going to gather with them because I love them. Because I love them. Because I need that word to sustain me. It's a rough world out there. And every day we're around the world. We're around the world that's telling us everything that's counter to the word of God. We need that edification. And we need that correction. We need that correction. Because there's nobody in here that is sinless. There's nobody in here that is walking as holier than thou. We, we need that correction from one another. So we need our brothers and sisters to say, hey brother, hey sister, you seem to be struggling in your walk with the Lord. Not out of, I'm sure we've all known somebody who do this in the past, but not out of a sense of, well, I'm going to tell on them or I'm going to show them how I'm somehow more spiritual than them, but out of a natural desire. Like I said, as a, a husband would love his wife naturally, as we should as Christians love Christ. That natural desire to love your brother and sister. And doing it, the correction, for their good. And for your good. Because again, their spiritual gift is for you. So if they're correct, corrected, and they're walking in right standing with the Lord, their gifting is blessing you. And we'll see that when it comes to submitting to your elders as well. All right, so... This is something I believe many genuine Christians in good churches could improve on. It's, it's getting together and, and, and loving as a community. Uh, even as I said, even good churches. Seeking out to get to know their church members outside of Sunday mornings. Because we do make the things that are priorities to us a priority, do we not? 
And as, as I said, you know, the, the, it's so easy to prioritize things in life. Like, for example, another example. And I know you mentioned this, and this, this, isn't, a, this isn't anything on this church. I want to hear this my second time. I'm saying that this happens. But how many of us would honestly be late to work on a regular basis? How many of us would get up and say, I'm going to be 15 minutes late to work? Probably wouldn't have a job after a while of doing that. But when it comes to the, to the day of the Lord coming together on the, on the Lord's day, um, we should make that a priority, which is more important in our work. To make that a priority so that when we gather together, we are coming with a desire to come and hear from God through His Word. Because we make those other things in life priorities. We find the time to do the things that we want to do. We find the time to do the things that we love. And if we genuinely love Christ and genuine, genuinely love believers, then we can find and make the time to gather together to study his word. So when we come together on the Lord's Day with those saints, and now that we've gotten to know them, we know their needs, we know we are aware of their struggles, and we can continue to build them up. Which is why when we consider those three exhortations, the let us that we saw, uh, which we've looked at, we see the importance of now verse 25. All right, verse 25 in Hebrews chapter 10 says, Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, the purpose of these exhortations to the saints is to not forsake the gathering. King James says that, don't forsake the gathering together, <clears throat> as the, the church, as some have done. Because some are doing this then. And John Gill in his commentary, he says this about this verse. It is the duty of saints to assemble together for public worship on the account of God who has appointed it, who approves of it, and whose glory is concerned in it, and on the account of the saints themselves, that they may be delighted, refreshed, comforted, instructed, edified, and perfected, and on account of others, that they may be convinced, converted, and brought into the knowledge of faith of Christ, and in imitation of the primitive saints, as an assembling together ought not to be forsaken, for it is a forsaking God, and their own mercies, and such are like to be forsaken of God nor is it known what is lost hereby. And it is the first outward visible step to apostasy and often issues in it. And how often have we seen, Pastor, you've probably seen this as a pastor. Many of you may have seen this as well. How often is it when you start to see somebody who may have even came here through the, the, the life of this church who was coming faithfully, and then one week they're not here. Then another week they're not here. And somebody goes and checks up on them, and, oh, I got busy, I got things going on. And before you know it, they're not even in the faith. These are signs of, of, of danger ahead when we start to forsake the assembling together. Now, that's not to say that there aren't at times reasons why we can't be together. <clears throat> Recovering from surgery, being sick, you know, um, things may, may take you away. But that should not be the, the, yeah, thank you, the majority of, of the times we come together. It shouldn't be that. And you start to see these people slip away slowly. Start missing prayer meeting, start missing Bible study, start missing the church assembly, start dabbling in sin. You correct them because you don't see what they're doing. You can't say, hey, brother, you know, sister. I want to encourage you. You need to be here. So we're so afraid in the culture to tell brothers and sisters, like, hey, you weren't at church this week. 
know you had no good reason to do that. Brother, I care for your soul. That's why I'm telling you this. Not because I'm trying to increase the numbers in attendance, but because I care for your soul. That's why. So obviously those who, who do so uh, show that they were those who leave the faith, who apostatize. They show that they were not truly of the faith, as the Bible tells us. But these are warnings in the Bible for us to take heed of. There's warnings there for us to take heed of. And this here is that warning. You know, uh, as it says, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some. Now, in the first century, they would have experienced things that we don't necessarily experience here today when it comes to persecution. I think it's coming. We're not there yet. In other parts of the world, they experience persecution that we don't see here in, in America. But there, as I said, to identify with Christ, to be baptized in Christ, was to, to basically cut yourself off from your family, to cut yourself off from any job opportunities that, that you could probably have because of the fact that people weren't going to, to uh, hire you or they weren't going to sell to you or, or let you buy from them because you would have to make offerings to their God. and Christians wouldn't do that. They wouldn't submit. They wouldn't bow the knee to Caesar. They wouldn't do those things. So there's one Lord. And so they suffered the persecution. And so we, we don't necessarily see that today, but we, we still see forms of persecution. Right? People that mock you, laugh at you. Oh, there goes those Christians going to church again. They always got a Bible in their hand. That's small persecution. That's, that's small compared to what some of our brothers and sisters experienced and what they experienced in the first century. And so they may have been here, as what the, the writer may be saying, as some of the habit of some, pulling away because of that. Pulling away because of that persecution. Paul even says, Demas forsaken me because he broke the world. So we even see this happening this one is obviously it's written in the first century. It's happening there. And it's still happening today. People forsaking what they've been taught, what they've claimed to hold to because of their love for the world. Let's get ahead here. Now, what I want to do is. <clears throat> I want to look at some of the ways that we see the church, okay? The church is known as the ecclesia, the called out ones. As I said, it's by God's election. He calls his people out as his own. His sheep hear his voice and they come. And if we see the church as it is seen by God, as the bride of Christ, maybe the society and other professing Christians but as I said earlier, have a much higher view of the church. And we wouldn't hear those phrases like I mentioned in the beginning, where people make excuses why you don't need to go to church, you don't need to be a member of the church. So the ecclesia, it's, it's the called out ones. And in, in a Christian sense, in dealing with the, the church, um, you have the whole body of Christians scattered throughout the earth. This includes the assembly of faithful Christians already dead and received in heaven. It's all the Christians all across the world, dead and alive, are in this universal church. It's an invisible church. Okay? Which is why Brunswick Community Church, brothers and sisters here, I go to Grace Covenant Church, and we're brothers and sisters there. And then we have maybe Presbyterian brothers and sisters, and then some other uh, brothers and sisters who maybe claim to be non-denominational brothers and sisters here. But as I said earlier, we have that unity in Christ. So we're brothers and sisters. We, we are in the body, those that are truly brothers and, and sisters. Because within the universal church, this invisible church, there are no false converts. There's none. It is made up of only believers. Now, that's the invisible church. And it, it has everyone that's dead that is a believer in Christ up to everyone that is alive today that is a believer in Christ. Now, the local church, which is the main focus of much of what we are talking about today, 
is the fact that you see this church here, a church across the street, and other churches up and down uh, this, this area here in uh, Brunswick, uh, and then across other cities and across the United States, and then even into the world. You have these different local churches where people assemble together. Now, within the local church, you can have unbelievers. There could be people here today that are not a believer in Christ. They may believe in their heart that they are, but as the Bible tells us, the heart can be deceptive. So they may be believing it, but not really truly holding fast to that confession that was given to us. It's an intellectual belief. Like my two boys right there would tell you, yeah, they believe Jesus died on the cross, but they're not saved. It's, it's not an intellectual belief. It's something that truly transforms and changes your heart. Changes your desires. And so in that local church, you're going to have, as the Bible tells us, sheep and goats. The sheep being God's people and the goats being not God's people growing up alongside each other or raised up alongside each other. You're going to have the wheat and the tear. And it's not our job as Christians to try to rip out all the weeds um, because in doing so we might hurt those that are truly weak. But it's our job as Christians to encourage one another to build them up. And in the end, God's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. So we love them. We love them. And we, 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 we pray for them and we seek to see them grow. <clears throat> so that is what we see is the local church Now, I want to give you some examples from Scripture. I want to give you some examples from Scripture of the universal church that we see in, in the Word of God. In Matthew 16, when Jesus comes uh, to Peter, and he says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. This is before Christ was crucified. Okay, he's telling him, I'm going to build my church. Not Peter being the rock upon which he's going to build the church as the Roman Catholic Church would teach you, but Christ being that rock. And he was going to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, God has appointed in the church, this is what God has appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Now, I am one that is a sensationist, and I believe your pastor is as well. So this is in the first century. Paul's writing this, and he's saying these things are given to the church. The apostles were there. The last of the prophets were dying off, and these gifts were given to authenticate these apostles and authenticate this message because Christ is no longer here. But now we have this. We don't have a need for the signs to prove it. These gifts were given for that. But these were appointed to the church at that time and to go forth and to authenticate, as I said, God's word. Colossians 1.18 and verse 24 talks about, and he is the head, meaning Christ, of the body, the church. So this is, this is God speaking about the universal church, Right? And 1 Timothy 3.15 says, If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church. So Paul writing to Timothy is saying, look, I'm, I'm writing to you, so now you know how to behave in the, in the household of God, which is the church. This is universal. This is a universal church that's spread out throughout all the world and known world at that time as they were beginning to go in and plant these churches. Now, when we come to the local church, because see, I've heard people on the street say, we're a part of the body. Where two or three are gathered together, there we are in this, there he is in our midst. We can do church at the coffee shop down the street, just two of us getting together. No, my dear friends, that's not the church. That's getting together at a coffee shop, coffee shop and having some fellowship with friends over the word of God. Okay. Now, when, when that is given in its context in Matthew 18, it's dealing with church discipline. It's dealing with church discipline. So therefore, if it's dealing with church discipline, where does church discipline happen? Within the confines of the church. Right? 
So Matthew 18, he says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. So if a brother sins, you go to him and you try to confront him in it. If he doesn't, if he refuses to listen, you go and get others to come and be witnesses. If they refuse, or if he refuses still, you take it to the church. Let the church hear the matter. What is the purpose of church discipline? It's not because you want to kick somebody out of the church. It's to restore them to right relationship with God and then right relationship to one another. It's for their benefit. People don't like church discipline. But it's to the church. This is the church in a, in a local sense. Uh, Acts 9.31. And I have a lot of lists. I'm obviously not going to go through these. This PDF is up on our website uh, for download if, if somebody wanted it. But in Acts 9.31, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit it multiplied. The church throughout Judea and Galilee. This is the church universally, but I wanted to point this out is there's these different places where these churches are. Okay? We see where um, in Acts 15 he says, talks about strengthening the churches. There's a plural there, plurality there. So again, it's making that emphasis that while we are all a part of this universal church, within that universal church, there are places that are set up, Brunswick Community Church, and I don't know any other solid churches around here. Not that there aren't, but I, I don't know them. And then maybe another church down the street that is, they're part of this body. They're the churches of God, right? So there's this local sense, which is where we see God working through the local church. I run into to people at times that uh, will tell me they don't, as I said, don't need to be a part of the church, and they're out preaching on the streets, and, and I'm like, God blesses through the church. So if you're not a part of a church, you have a desire to be a part of the church, God's not blessing you in the ministry. The ministry goes through God's appointed means. As I said, he doesn't only uh, declare the end from the beginning, but he declares the means to get there. And his church is the means to bring about heaven on earth, right? It's his means for us to get a glimpse of heaven through the church, through the local church. Now, within the church, there is what we, we call the, the means of grace that is provided within the church. Okay? This is given to us in Acts 2.42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. So every time when a church comes together, they are receiving the means of grace. This is not something that can be administered outside of the, the, the confounds of the church. Because God has given gifts to the church. He's given pastors to the church, which we'll, we'll look at as well. Um, but these are what takes place. The apostles' teaching, the teaching, the doctrine. The doctrine is given. Fellowship, and this isn't fellowship like I said earlier, where we may get together outside of church. This is fellowship that is that is centered around the Word, centered around God's Word in our growth. The breaking of bread, talking about communion, gathering together to partake of the Lord's Supper. These are means of grace, and the prayers, the prayers of the saints. This is this is the means of grace that God has given to His church that are administered through His church. Why, again, the local church is so important. Now, there's roles within the local church. As I said in Ephesians 4, God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists. Actually, I said a different verse, but prophets, uh, apostles, excuse me, prophets and evangelists and shepherds to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the structure of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro. So these are given apostles, prophets, the, the, the elders, these pastors, teachers, evangelists, for the building up of the church. For what? For our protection. For our safety. So that we don't get tossed to and fro. We don't get tossed around by every wind of doctrine that comes in. So in a church down the street that's, that has a female pastor is saying, hey, come on in. You know, we're very open and accepting. And your pastor stands up and says, my dear brothers and sisters, that's not a church. Beware of that teaching. 
It's to protect your soul. It's to guard you. Now, in speaking of the apostles, we all, the 12, you, you know, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, uh, James, Thaddeus, and Simon, uh, and Judas, who betrayed Jesus. These are these 12 disciples, 11 of them the apostles. Uh, but then we also see that um, one of the apostles was replaced, well, Judas was replaced by Matthias. And then we also have Paul, who is the apostle to the Gentiles. To which we owe much because, to the glory of God, not to, to praise Paul, but we owe much because we are Gentiles. And so, we know that there's neither Jew nor Greek in Christ, we're one. So Paul is called to the, as the apostle to the Gentiles. Then we see prophets. You know, this is another gift that God has given to the church in the Old Testament. We see many prophets, right? Abraham, Daniel, uh, David, Elijah, Elisha, uh, Ezekiel, Moses. Uh, but then in the New Testament, we see a few prophets as well. John the Baptist, Agabus, who prophesies over Paul. And then Jesus, who is the great prophet, our greatest of prophets, and our priest and our king. Now, evangelist, the evangelist is a, a bringer of good news, a missionary bearing, a bearer of good news. And we have one example of that in Scripture of, of Philip being the evangelist that brings the good news. What I'm trying to do here is, is, is go through what the church looks like, this local church, what is in this local church, so that you have an understanding of that. And you may have already, already do have an understanding of that, but just want to put some emphasis on that. Um, so you have shepherds and teachers within the church, elders. Uh, we would say pastors, or some churches would say bishops, not Roman Catholic, because that's not a church, but some would say bishops, right? Uh, and we see the qualifications for these elders in 1 Timothy 3, <coughs> 1 through 7, okay? God is laying out to us, through the Apostle Paul, the qualification for these elders, the qualification for them. And then... The work of these apostles, we see in Acts, they were trying to, to, to partake of the apostles' teachings, the, the breaking of bread, the fellowship, and the prayers, and they wanted to devote themselves to the study of the word, and so then they bring in seven men and they make them deacons. Deacons, which are servants. Many Baptist churches today, independent fundamentalist Baptist churches, and some, maybe even SBC churches, uh, will have deacons as a, kind of in a role of elders, but a deacon is one who serves. They were, they were brought in to be servants, to come alongside and help and assist the pastor in uh, the work of building up the saints. And then we have the laity, or the members, which is many of us here, members of the church, which are called to, these are the things which we are called to do as members of the body. And all, even pastors, everybody's called to do this, but as members, we don't just have a responsibility to come and sit and hear. We have a responsibility to do. So we are to love the Lord God and love neighbor as self, not to forsake the assembling together on the Lord's day. We are to submit to our elders. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your soul. As I said, they're here to guard you. As those who will have an excuse me, as those who will have to give an account, let them do so with joy and not with groaning, for that would be no advantage to you. It's not to their advantage, it's to your advantage when you're submitting to your elders. We're called to be witnesses for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 says we are called as ministers of reconciliation, as ambassadors of Christ. We're called as Christians to rightly handle the word of God. Everything that I'm saying up here and that your pastor says each and every week, we have to be able to rightly handle the Word of God and test those things and see if, if those things be true in the Scriptures. We're called as brothers and sisters in Christ to restore one another, to guard ourselves, and to bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6 tells us. And we're to stand up against injustice in Proverbs 31. We are to submit to the governing authorities because those authorities have been given by God. So the, the role of the church is extremely important and extremely vital 
in the life of believers. So I, I pray and I hope that this will help you see the beauty and importance of the local church and understand our my heart's desire for you and everybody that I talk to and when I put this together as I said this was something I have been working on already in because I deal with this so often is that we would have a genuine love for the church that we would come together we would draw near to Christ draw near to God that we would hold fast to the confession that has been handed down to us and that we would stir one another up to love and good works and not forsake that assembling together. So let's pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, I, I pray, Lord, that you would take what is said today and that you would apply it to our hearts and help us to desire your word, help us to desire uh, to attend together and gather together uh, as the body. Father, at times I feel like I'm rambling and I, and I feel like I'm so inadequate to, to even open your, your word and, and to, to teach it to other people. And so, Father, I just pray that wherever I was unclear or wherever I stumbled or, or wasn't able to articulate what I may have wanted to articulate, I pray, Lord, that you would take your word and do what only you can do. And that you would use it to change our hearts and our minds. That we would grow deeper in our knowledge and understanding of who you are that our love for you would grow, that we would see you as the beautiful Christ that you are, the magnificent God of the universe who has sent your Son to die for us, that we could have life. And that we would see the church as, as a picture of what we will be, of what it will be like in heaven for all eternity. To glorify you without without the, the wickedness of our flesh, the sinful sinfulness that still remains, but that we will be free from that completely. And that we will be able to solely focus upon glorifying you throughout all eternity. Change our hearts, Lord. Conform them to your word. Help us to grow in our knowledge of it. Because ultimately your word, as you said to those, those Pharisees in that day, they searched the scriptures because in them they think they can find life. But it is your word that points us to you. So Father, I pray that you would point us to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Take a few